How'd you like to listen to .NET Rocks with no ads? Easy. Become a patron. For just $5 a month, you get access to a private RSS feed where all the shows have no ads. $20 a month will get you that and a special .NET Rocks patron mug. Sign up now at patreon.netrocks.com. Hey, Carl and Richard here. As you may have heard, NDC is back, offering their incredible in-person conferences around the world. And we'd like to tell you about them. NDC Oslo will be May 21st through the 25th. Go to ndcoslo.com to register. NDC Copenhagen is happening August 27th through the 31st. Go to ndccopenhagen.com for more information. NDC Porto is happening October 16th through the 20th. The early bird discount for NDC Porto ends July 21st. Go to ndcporto.com to register. And check out the full lineup of conferences at ndcconferences.com. Hey, guess what? It's .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Kappel. We're here again for your listening pleasure. And this will be episode 1840. Well, there you go. Who knew? Yeah, who knew indeed. Wait till you see the Wayback Machine I'm tapping for the comment on this show. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. Yeah. Well, I can't wait. But first, I have something for you. Okay. With Better Know Framework. Awesome. All right, buddy, what do you got? Well, our old buddy Simon Crop is at it again. He's wicked smart. He is just ridiculous smart. And, you know, I think the, the it's the water in Australia. that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe it's the water in America. I don't know. Anyway, uh, he wrote this great um, source-only repo mm -hmm. called Polyfill. Wait, we we did we used to do Polyfill for web. Yeah, this is Polyfill for .NET. It's, it exposes newer .NET and C# -sharp features to older runtimes. What older runtimes? So .NET Standard two mm -hmm. designed to support uh, .NET four six one uh, all the way to .NET eight. Right. Dot net eight. Interesting. And if you, yeah, if you go there, you'll see a detailed list of all of the polyfills that he's implemented. How cool is that? That's really clever. Yeah. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. I really like that feature of C sharp eight, but, uh, I don't have C sharp eight. Yeah. I can't use C sharp eight for whatever reason. So I only do it as a polyfill. Like this is something that Microsoft's not going to build. Right. They're going to tell you, uh, just use dot net eight. Excellent. So that's it. Know it, learn it, love it. And uh, Simon's just, uh, again, really, really smart guy. So brilliant. Yeah. That's very clever. I expect it to be just as great as everything else that he's done. Who's talking to us today, Richard? You know, we are doing a show about Fiddler today. Yeah. And the la I went and looked on, like, when's the last time we talked about Fiddler as like a show? We did one with Eric Lawrence, like episode 809, like a <laughs> thousand shows ago. Yeah. It's a little too old, but we, we reference Fiddler on a regular basis. And this led to a great little comment chain where on episode 1072, we were talking to uh, Shay Friedman about uh, Chrome developer tools yeah. and Fiddler came up in that conversation. And that led to a show we did with Brad Abrams about the Google Cloud back in 2015. That was show 1083. Holy crap. Right. Brad Abrams. Brad Abrams, who I think is back at Microsoft again. Really? Like, I'll, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. He escaped to Google after the Silverlight thing went to its up and then he came back. Uh, yeah. He's coming back around. You know, what comes around goes around kind of thing. Uh, but wow. years later. I, I but, always liked him. But the what I what I appreciate the fact that we're talking about Fiddler is this comment from Days Russell, which admittedly is from eight years ago, uh, uh, eight hundred episodes ago, uh, and where Dave says, you know, Fiddler is required for any non-browser endpoints you want to debug, and anything that requires a post, a put, or delete, and it can act as a reverse proxy, and it can act as a proxy for embedded devices, and and actually, Fiddler's not going anywhere anytime soon. It's right. a fantastic tool. And saying you don't need is like saying you don't need the rest of the internet because Amazon sells everything. <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah. Who <laughs> says that anyway? 
Well, and it's just a, for me, it's a great moment to realize like, hey, this has been an amazing tool for forever and we don't talk about it often enough. So I'm excited to talk about it again. Yeah, me too. So Dave, thank you so much for your comment and a copy of Music to Code by is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code by, write a comment on the website at .net rocks.com or on Facebook, publish every show there. And if you comment there and I read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code by. And you could certainly follow us on Twitter, but we'd prefer you follow us on Mastodon because there's more cool stuff happening there. I'm at Carl Franklin at techhub.social. And I'm Rich Campbell at mastodon.social. And send us a toot and uh, definitely sign up. It's good stuff. We're here with Sam Basu and Rosen Vladimirov. Uh, let me introduce them. Sam, of course, has been on the show many times. Uh, he's a technologist, author, speaker, Microsoft MVP, gadget lover, and developer advocate for Telerik. With a long developer background, he now spends much of his time advocating modern web mobile cloud development platforms on Microsoft Telerik stacks. His spare times call for travel, fast cars, cricket. Cricket? Somebody actually plays that game? Oh, and uh, culinary adventures for the family. You can find him on the internets. Uh, Rosen Vladimirov is a senior software engineering manager at Progress Software Corporation. Like how I pronounced that for you, Richard? Progress? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very nice. Just my inner Canadian came out. Throughout his career, he has been in different roles and worked with various technologies, including WPF, Silverlight, .NET, Node.js, TypeScript, Angular, and Electron. Currently, he leads the engineering team responsible for all Fiddler products. He loves helping others, and that's why he's so involved in building developer tools such as Fiddler everywhere, with the goal of making everyday tasks easier. Welcome, guys. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for having us over here. Um, I thought um, I was old, and then I met you people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sam, we, we, how many shows have you done with us? Probably this a lot. Is, we I could probably number, figure it out. Number four. Yeah, yeah. a few. But, mm -hmm. you know, congratulations on 1,800 plus episodes. Yeah, you know, after, after 1,700, you just stop counting. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all the same, really. And welcome, Rosen. This is your first time with us. Hey, guys. Yeah, thanks for having me here. You're certainly welcome. Uh, and thanks for Fiddler. What's new in the Fiddler world? I guess, you know, we should start with that comment. Um, there, there is a, it's easy to dismiss Fiddler because we have such great tools in the browser, but the browser tools don't go far enough for every situation, do they? No, they don't. Um, so let's kind of dive in. Uh, and I'm the fluff. Rosen is the stuff who actually knows this <laughs> thing, but I will, I'll try my best to set the stage. Uh, so, you know, like the comment said, it's been a long journey. Uh, this kind of started back with, you know, um, Eric, uh, way back, um, with his Microsoft days. And it's, you know, it's been a tool that so many developers over, you know, the last, you know, decade or two have kind of grown up with, you know, you use this every day as a part of your, you know, dev tool set. And at its very essence, it's a network debugging uh, tool. It's a proxy. Uh, so it lets you capture all types of network. And uh, here, you know, comes in some of the differentiators where your browser dev tools are, you know, pretty darn good these days, but they only go uh, as far. Uh, we are talking about every type of app, you know, uh, yeah. I do a lot of, you know, cross platform mobile and, you know, desktop stuff. And so the moment you step outside the web, um, the dev tools uh, don't, you know, work as well. Uh, and also, we are talking about uh, lots of other things that you need. You should, you know, never be in doubt as a developer as to what's going on in your network and how you function together as a team, your, your collaborations, and also doing things like, uh, you know, proxying things where you don't always want to go to the network, oh. having a strong rules engine so you can, you know, fake things on and off, um, having ways to save sessions and share them with your team and, you know, understanding how your user are actually using our, your apps so that when they have issues and when they come to your, you know, QA and support people, you're not wasting cycles understanding what's going on. I, I get the, the packet sniffer kind of idea, but do, does it go so far as to being a protocol analyzer? Like, can I put it between uh, me and a USB device and say, hey, can you log all the traffic going between these two things? No, in, in the current situation, it's, uh, it's more of a network debugging uh, helper tool uh, that you can use to capture all of your network traffic. Uh, as some mentioned, uh, for many years, Fedor was famous like uh, the, as a web debugging tool. Uh, but now we are trying to to help our users to understand that it's not only the, the web here. There are many types of network requests that you can handle and capture with Fedor and to help you 
find out what the issue with them or even simulate uh, different errors and see how your applications will be safe when you uh, when such errors happen. Yeah. Okay. Get it. Uh, yeah. Just trying to establish the boundaries of expectation here mm-hmm. in terms of what, what it's available. So, you know, we're talking to developers. It's a developer debugging tool and uh, that's, that's its realm. That's the milieu. And is it still a browser-based tool, or are there standalone applications? Yes, there are. So actually, before we you know jump into tools and and features, uh, I think it's important to talk about what you know Rosen and the team have done with Fiddler in the last you know uh, several years. Please, it's not just one tool anymore. It's become like a product family. It's a portfolio of you know multiple things that work together wow. uh, to help out developers. So at its very you know uh, basic core, Fiddler used to be a you know Windows app, and that's still there it's what we call fiddler classic and you know it's feature rich a lot of you know people use it you know every day in their dev uh, you know cycles and nothing wrong with that uh, we are not moving the cheese but we also have to reinvent fiddler for how modern developers work and we right. want that freedom to be you know building any type of app on any platform so right. um, you know fiddler everywhere is our uh, you know most uh, up to date fiddler tool and it is cross platform so now you can use fiddler wow. On Windows, Mac, and Linux, and this was something of a request for like a decade for us to sure, yeah. uh, make it work on Mac and Linux. But now you can, and it's you know a native tool that works everywhere and functions exactly the same consistently UI UX wise. Uh. Uh, but that's just you know the capturing part of it. But we also have Fiddler in a few uh, you know different modes. When it comes to uh, you know understanding how your users are seeing errors um, in their apps uh, when they're using it, we have you know two little things. One is called Fiddler Jam, which is essentially a Chromium-based uh, browser extension, yeah. and this is something you want your non-technical people to just you know go to the extension store on both you know Chrome or Edge and be able to just quickly install an extension and run your app, uh, capture what's going on in your app, and share it back with the QA folks when yeah. you're you know giving us a ticket and it it can do you know other things like capturing a video, all of the necessary logs, um, and that's for browser-based tools. If you have a Windows-based app, then we have something called Fiddler Cap, which is the same idea. It's a very lightweight um, you know little app that you install that captures local traffic. Again, mostly for you know uh, non-technical people. And then we also have Fiddler Core, which is essentially the engine that drives all of Fiddler's functionality that has been separated from the UI part of it. So you can actually have Fiddler Core as a .NET embeddable library so you can, you know, light up your dashboards or, you know, things that you want to embed in your own apps. So that's the whole Fiddler family of five different things now. And these are all, I mean, from Fiddler Core on up, this is all HTTP, HTTPS traffic and analyzing. Yes, and this is where again Rosen and team have been, you know, um, very active. Uh, you know, a lot of new things have happened. The web isn't the same as it was 20 years mm-hmm. back. HTTP one is where we started now. You know, HTTP two, and we are even look, looking forward. So yes, HTTP and HTTPS, um, making sure we can capture uh, both unencrypted and encrypted traffic, and also getting down to a slightly lower level. Uh, I, I don't want to spill Rosen's bills, uh, but you know, <laughs> things like web sockets, things like uh-huh. gRPC. Yeah. Those are things we think about a lot. Love it. Okay, because those things aren't transported over HTTPS. No, so we can step one level down uh, and, you know, take a look at what apps are doing under the covers. GRPC web is, of course, but uh, GRPC, I think, requires HTTP2. Is that right? I think so. Yes. It's yep. uh, suggested that you use HTTP2. And because, like, that's way, that's how you can, you know, get those parallel requests and responses. It's a truly bi directional, uh-huh. uh, you know, uh, stream of information between the server and the client. And, you know, we can capture it all. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. When I think back to the original Eric Lawrence version of Fiddler, it was really a wrapper over Win iNet, if I remember correctly. Wow. That's taken me back. It just was able to look at the traffic back and forth from there. So if you're getting off, I can imagine people saying, yeah, we'd like it to be other than Windows. It's like, you mean totally rewrite it because <laughs> it was, it was a wrapper over Win iNet. Yeah. That's yeah. very true. Definitely not the case. And, uh, it was, uh, it's not only this difference that makes it uh, more difficult because, yeah, as you've mentioned, you need to rewrite the whole logic to to support it on different operating systems. But in addition, when uh, we decided to go on with uh, HTTP2 support, um, we had to rewrite a lot of other things because HTTP2 is a lot more different. So 
even now it, it is still in beta. We are waiting for feedback and gathering feedback from our users. And now after we have it, um, we will soon move the, the feature out of beta support. Uh, but it was important for us to, to ensure that we have not um, broken something that was working for, for the users because the, the essence is that you need to capture traffic and easily understand what's going wrong. But still, as Sam mentioned, the, the network has, been cha- has changed for a lot of different aspects. For example, the TOS 1.3 is something that um, we are currently working on and will soon be out. Uh, as a feature in Fedora everywhere, uh, you know that it is it is out there for maybe five or six years, mm-hmm. but still many many servers uh, do not support it. Maybe due to the security, the the fact that it has only five ciphers that are supported in it. So many applications still struggle to to have this supported. But in terms of security, it is much more secure, and people actually want to use it. So. At that point, we wanted to help our users to, to be able to test which are the servers which support it, how to, uh, how to use them, how to inform even their security team that there is something broken there. Uh, so we were, we've been working uh, on the last uh, couple of weeks for this feature and soon we'll have it. Fantastic. As an end user, some of the things that we, you know, uh, have thought of, uh, thought through in the last few years is your experience if you are kind of new to Fiddler and you're kind of getting started, right? So uh-huh. with Fiddler everywhere, you have, you know, one installer that, you know, recognizes your OS and you, you install it for Mac, Windows or, you know, uh, or, or Linux. And then it can be a little overwhelming because Fiddler is essentially a network proxy. So everything on your machine goes through that. So when uh-huh. you open it up for the first time, it starts capturing just about everything. It's just a lot of streaming data. So we think about, you know, experiences like filters. So you can, you know, turn things on and off as you go. Uh, maybe you don't want, you know, <laughs> it's a kind of a little embarrassing because you see, you know, Apple and Google and Microsoft, everybody calling home with all of their services. So you can turn those things off. You can just say, show me network for just this app and nothing yeah. else. Show me only local host and nothing else. Show me only 404s and nothing else. So filtering and, you know, giving you all the knowledge and buttons when you do your traffic capturing. That's important for us. You know, little things like, uh, you know, dark mode and light mode support uh, so that we're not, you know, uh, uh, forcing people to work in a certain way. Uh, That's important. And uh, we kind of want to keep you there. Once you are there, you don't need to, you know, open up anything else. Uh, You know, API composition is important for, you know, anytime you are going from your, you know, client apps to another, you know, service. uh, So Uh we let you, you know, have a nimble API composer that lets you, you know, do things with authentication, with, you know, service packets going in and out and, you know, just fine tuning it. Maybe you're working in a team. Maybe you have a, you know, middleware team and you have a client services team. You have a database team. All of them can, you know, talk through those APIs right. and, you know, get a nice team collaboration going. Now, isn't Fiddler an open source product? No, it isn't an open source. It is closed source, but um, we are working uh, with different people who are helping us in the when we want to have a feature that is, uh, let's say, HTTP2 or gRPC, we're trying to find people who are actually using those protocols, those versions, and try to to work with them on the specification of the feature, on the requirements, and then on testing this feature. We are always trying to, to include in the application only features that we have designed and tested with external users. Because... Yeah, as I've mentioned already, the important part is to help the people and to ensure that we solve their use case or something that we think we will solve. Okay. So so it's now, our, our, is it only a retail product? Or? Yeah, it, it is commercial. So okay. you know, we we do a lot of open source work. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, you know, Rosen and we have to feed our kids and sure. engineering is expensive. So Fiddler Classic, uh, it's going to stay the way it is, uh, you know, always free uh, for Windows. But Fiddler Everywhere has been, you know, three or four years at okay. least of engineering. Uh, so it's behind a little subscription model, which is, you know, the cost of a cup of coffee for a month. Sure. All right. Yeah. So there is this still the the original free product, admittedly with a whole lot of updates. You know, still being maintained. The the WinINet product is out there, but if you want the everywhere product, that one's retail. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, it has extra things that are, you know, starting to not quite be uh, everywhere. Um, right. Because uh, like all of the, you know, latest innovations have been on Fiddler everywhere. Uh, you know, how you build rules and how you work with teams and that type of stuff is particularly, you know, very heavy on Fiddler everywhere. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, it's good that it's good that you have that. And I think that's that's a fair thing. You have a free product. And if you need more, you pay for more. Yeah, that's fine. When did uh, work start on everywhere, Rosen? Uh, I think it was back in the 2019, but uh, the first official version came out in 2020 in the COVID time. Yeah. So uh, that's when it was born and it was released in July 2020. Uh -huh. uh, but the actual work and ideas for having a cross platform tool started um, earlier. Uh, one of the important things that we wanted to uh, to do is to to ensure that we have modern technologies. So you know that Fiddler Classic uh, is using WinForms. It is uh, really hard to write the whole thing and to if you need to to change something. There's a lot of logic on many different places. I I've written other WinForms application. I like the technology, but still it doesn't give you the the flexibility of the modern technologies. So, sure. Once we we decided that we need to to write a new tool, uh, it was more of a decision of technology, and we decided to use Electron, Angular, and uh, .NET for this. So it's actually an Electron-based application. Uh, in the Angular parts, uh, we are building just a thin layer of UI, and the whole work is again in the .NET part of the application. But still, in the in the Angular part, we managed to to use our Telerik cont uh, controls or can do in this case and we manage to handle a lot of data inside uh, inside the UI. You know, some already mentioned that when you start Fedor and you notice how everyone is uh, doing a lot of requests. For example, we have a feature that allows you to start a new instrumented browser. We call it instrument, but it's actually a clean instance of a Chromium browser. And okay. once you start it, we capture everything from it. It's automatically um, targeting the the feedback proxy. So what you will notice if you if you do it is that even from the moment when the browser starts till the first request that you want to execute, for example, Google for something or whatever you do, uh, you see at least uh, three hundred requests for tracking, for uh, analytics, for whatever it is. Wow! So it's is visible there. Well, and it, and it gets back to the classic problem of all of these kinds of logging tools, which is like you are facing a fire hose, just a huge amount of data, and somewhere in there is the one little bit of information you wanted. Uh -huh. That's exactly right, because, you know, it's it's a lot, and that's where the filtering really comes in handy. And, you know, to Rosen's point, um, you, you have to understand how Fiddler is working. It is a low-level network proxy, so everything on your machine goes through that. Uh, and, and there is no escaping every, you know, every time Visual Studio calls home, everything is logged. So you really need to, you know, get down to exactly what you want to see. And this may not be an option if you are on a machine that is really heavily locked down because you need, do need to be an admin right. on your machine because sure. it's not just the tool. We would ask you to, you know, trust some certificates so we can, you know, crack open some, you know, encryption with HTTPS. So maybe you are on a machine that IT has, you know, really locked down, but you still want to be able to see your app uh, and debug network. So that's where that inbuilt uh, browser comes in. So that is already pre-configured. You don't need to nice. ask for an image permission, anything on that app fiddler will automatically capture even if you do not let it have all the permissions i'm kind of blown away by the idea that you can build an angular electron app that can get that low level uh yeah, so Rosen uh, kind of said it out loud, but I was going to present this as maybe a trivia because, you know, when you talk about a truly cross-platform app mm -hmm. nowadays, there aren't, you know, too many options out there on the table. And, you know, uh, Electron, uh, and we talk about .NET Maui and all of those things, but, you know, this is battle-tested. Yeah. And this has been out there for, you know, 10 plus years, how Electron has worked. If you know what you're doing and if you can manage your footprint, uh, this truly works. And, I mean, so many of our apps every day that we use are, you know, Know, electron apps and within that uh, the, the front end being angular uh, this is you know kudos to the team because
because we get asked a lot, like when you look at our Telerik UI for all of the .NET things, Kendo UI for all of the JavaScript things, uh, we care about performance because mm-hmm. we care about how developers, you know, uh, you know, work with our tools. Uh, nothing says like dog fooding more than Fiddler because what you see in Fiddler user interface, it's Kendo UI, uh, grids and, uh. you know, list views and talk about performance. This is like hundreds and thousands of things just streamed into a single app nonstop. That, so, for sure. uh, yeah, we are proud of how we have been able to, you know, utilize our own UI in building something. Can you talk a little bit about the rule builder? This is an intriguing feature for me. Right. So rule builder essentially is for you to uh, fine tune what type of traffic you want to capture and then what rules apply to certain types of traffic. So if me and Rosen are working together and I am building the backend for an app, then when his client side app wants to call in, maybe he doesn't want to go to the internet. Maybe he just wants to come and hit my box, my machine. Uh, so that's one instance. Or maybe you want to test out an app. And again, this is where we have worked a lot with people who have been using Fiddler Classic for a long time. We don't want to break their workflows. People use Fiddler for performance tuning yes. a lot, right? Yeah. So you are building an app and people are, you know, using your app in a variety of settings. If it's a PWA, maybe you are going from, you know, 5G, 4G, all the way down to, you know, almost no connectivity when you walk onto a plane. So how does your app experience look like? What if your JavaScript apps or, you know, uh, resources cannot be delivered? What if your CSS or images are bloated and they're not working right? In my house, we have zero G, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) health-wise, you might be in a very good spot. Yeah, I guess. Uh, but uh, fine-tuning those things, like what if your videos stop working? What if right. your you know images are missing? What if your JavaScript doesn't get delivered on time? Those are all things that Rule Builder is very very good with. It lets you you know uh, control exactly what the experience is when somebody makes a request, and you essentially get to be the middle person between that request and what comes back uh, to a client uh, who is making that request. You get to fake it, you get to you know slow it down, you get to not deliver things. So truly you know fine-tune the experience but rosen what did i miss oh i think you mentioned only the half of the powerful features there because <laughs> there you go even i cannot uh, cannot give exactly the amount of uh, items that you can do with do with this feature because it, it it's really powerful it allows you to match uh, the request based on the request or the response header for example it allows you to match even by uh the certificate uh the certificate validity and then do something with this traffic. You can even mark it, you can uh, modify it, you can replace uh-huh. it, or you can just return some errors or even do nothing, just just mark it so it will be easier for you to spot it in the in the grid. I'm reminded of that Boston song, More Than a Filter. Isn't that oh, it? Oh, jeez. I, I see me. my merry network traffic coming my way. No, and I guess that's your point, that filtering is easy. I only want to see that stuff, but now what do you do with it? You can change it, you can modify it. That's the the beauty of that rules engine, isn't it? That's right. And also, you know, how I use Fiddler might be different from how you use Fiddler, right? Right. It all depends on the type of app that you're building. Uh, You know, all of the web folks are cool, uh, but I'm an old school guy. I am stuck doing my desktop apps. Uh And, you know, nowadays I'm doing a lot of, you know, cross-platform mobile. And the moment you go to iOS or Android, Uh things fall apart very quickly because you want to be able to see those API calls and the traffic going to the devices, but you can't very easily. So this is where I have it used and set up is... I will have, you know, Fiddler be my one network proxy. I know my IP address of my machine and Fiddler essentially opens up one port. uh, And so I can make all of my iOS or Android devices instead of, you know, I can be on the same Wi-Fi as, you know, my home computer, but I can make all of that go through my IP. And that, that's the way I have it set up. So yes. I'm building an iOS app. I want that specific rule to come into play when I'm hitting Rosen's endpoint. And I uh, just want to see all of the traffic going in and out of my you know, mobile devices. That's, that's really cool. And that's stuff that you can't do without a proxy. Or, I mean, you can't just like write a WPF app that listens to a port with HTTP, you know, the little server. And you expect to hit that from a mobile device connected to your Wi-Fi. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Also, that's where the the rules come in hand because, for example, if you are building a mobile application and then it hits an, some endpoint, if you want to test it, what happens when the the endpoint is down when it uh, returns 404, 
404 or 403 or whatever, uh, instead of rebuilding the whole application or the server, you can just use Fiddler, return the, the response that you want and see how that behaves without modifying your applications, neither the, the mobile app, neither the, the server. Uh-huh. So I don't actually have to stop the server anymore. I can just yeah. spoof the 404. Yeah. Oh, this exactly. is no fun. You guys yeah. are taking away my fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think 404 uh, is kind of an extreme. It's, it's more like, how about I slow you down? Yeah. And, and then, then see how your app... That you know, reminds me of the old .NET Rocks trope. Uh, knock, knock. Who's there? Java. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. And with that, we're going to take a brief break for this very important message. There is always something new from our sponsor, Text Control. As a developer, do you need to integrate PDF generation, document editing, or electronic signatures into your ASP.NET Core or Angular applications? Or you want to learn more about the differences between electronic and digital signatures? Text Control is offering a free consulting service to educate you about digital document processing and how Text Control products can help you add these features to your applications. Go to textcontrol.com slash contact and request your free personal consultation. And we're back. It's Dodnet Rocks. I'm Richard Campbell. That's Carl Franklin. Yo, yo, yo. Talking to our friends Sam and Rosen a bit about the new Fiddler, the Fiddler Everywhere. Uh, and I'm immediately getting all these ideas of horrible things I could do to people with this tool. This tool is the ultimate man in the middle attack tool. Do, do you have your evil on? Is your evil showing? <laughs> Just, I mean, think about the trouble you, you could, could really cause could. with this tool. Well, I mean, any proxy you can get in trouble with, right? Yeah. As soon as, as, soon as you are literally in the middle, yeah. you get to do all kinds of nutty things. So if, if um, I'm on a developer team, I should probably ask my IT people if I can actually use this, shouldn't I? As long as you're the admin, you should be good. But, you know, like Richard <laughs> said, with great power comes responsibility. Great this is a lot of yes. evil Fiddler. power on your hands. It's your foot. <laughs> it's, <laughs> your, exactly. it's your network, yeah. right? Yeah, you could mess some stuff up here without a doubt. Yeah. Right. I mean, but only for the traffic in and out of your machine. You don't really go further afield than that. Yeah. Right. But the practical jumps and, and, to installing it on a friend's machine are endless. Hours of fun. Hours of fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, and maybe even you don't even need the full uh, fiddler to be installed if you're just trying to mess something. That's to be where, evil. you know, <laughs> the jam and the cap comes in. Yeah, so I was thinking with Fiddler Core, it's like I could be dynamically putting ads onto every page that talks specifically about you, you know? You know, on my other show, Security This Week, we have a little theme song. It goes like this. It's criminal career advice. Criminal career advice. Nice. Yeah. All right. Anyway, where were we? Uh, let's talk about some more features of Fiddler that we might not be talking about, like the API composer. What's the API composer? So think about um, you hitting any type of API. It could be, you know, just a backend service that, you know, somebody else uh, on your team is building or another team, or it could be, you know, an API halfway across the world. You want to, you know, you know, model with things as you're hitting that API. You want to see what are the parameters that I can send in? What comes back? Is it JSON? Is it something else? How can I format things? How can I be the man in the middle? Uh, and, you know, totally, you know, tweak everything that's going in and out. Uh-huh. So that's what the API composer is. Maybe some things are behind an auth wall and you get to, you know, uh, fake things if you want it to be. So it is, you know, just an API composer that you expect from a full featured uh, app like, you know, Fiddler. Right. So it's not so much the API composer, it's the API call composer, maybe? It's the client that hits the API? Yeah, sure. And, and it can be both ways. Like if, if your client application is hitting an API, then all, all of that will be captured as, you know, network sessions. Uh-huh. And by the way, I can save my sessions and then Rosen can, you know, pull up my same sessions, my sessions on his, you know, Fiddler. So that's nice. But uh-huh. if I am building an API or if I'm, you know, reaching out to an API that I do not have any control over, this gives me the, you know, visibility to understand how that API endpoint is working. Uh, you know, especially when it comes to crowd operations, create, read, update and delete, I need to know exactly what I, I need to send in and what comes 
comes back. So it gives me visibility. And, you know, sometimes it also, uh, not quite API composition, but some of the newer things that we have done that Rosen and team have done really help me out as a modern developer because I do web sockets. You mm. know, I do a lot of signal art these days, you know, especially with the you know, Blazor server side, ah. uh, with, you know, .NET MAUI. Uh, you know, I do a lot of real time apps and now I can, you know, step into a web sockets uh, connection and it'll, you know, show up as a different connection. It's not, you know, multiple HTTP requests uh, going back and forth. It's one connection. And then you can dive into uh, and see what the server and the client are talking about. Um, and it's, you know, it could be JSON, could be, you know, protobuf, but uh, uh, that's something we're excited about. And as we are uh, speaking today, uh, Rosen tells me that we are actually very close to putting out uh, a build uh, and a release that has uh, gRPC support. Is that right, Rosen? Yes, I'm exactly as you mentioned. So in the next few days, hopefully we'll have it out. And what will happen is that Fedora will allow you to have the, when HTTP2 is enabled to capture gRPC traffic. For this version, it will be in beta state, so we'll not be able to decode the traffic. But in the future, if there is an interest, interest from the people, we'll probably introduce functionality so you can uh, give your proto files and Fedora will be able to decode them and make them human readable for you. But for this release, we'll capture the traffic, we'll capture all of the um, communication that happens through gRPC in all of the four modes, uh, bi-directional mode, server only, and all of those. That's and awesome. you also have the, the hex inspector, which will allow you to, yeah, you will not see the fully decoded message, but you'll be able, at least the, the text part of it, you'll see some of the symbol there. Now, we could already do gRPC web before, because that's just over HTTPS, right? But, yeah. but gRPC, what you're talking about, is the one that requires HTTP2. A lot of .NET developers don't use that, right? Because of, uh, you know, Azure didn't, didn't support HTTP2. I think it does now, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does now. And, and things are coming along. Yeah. I mean, anybody who is using, you know, microservices yeah. uh, has to depend on that. Yeah. Um, so, and then cool. ASP.NET is welcoming gRPC with, you know, open, uh, open arms. So, uh, things are moving along and, you know, we want to make sure we are set up for, you know, the next, you know, five, six years as, yeah. you know, gRPC grows. James and Newton King. People, that's true. Yeah. He's the guy. Yeah. And however is your, uh, you know, the way in which your serialization, deserialization works, we don't care. Like, just as long as it's network, um, we can capture it. Yeah. As long as we can decrypt it, because you got the right certs in the right places, right? Now, all of this is essentially for developers, everything that we have talked about. And mm-hmm. again, this is how I work, because, like, this is part of my, you know, dev tool chain because I, I use this every day as I'm building, you know, modern web, mobile or desktop apps. But we have to think about, you know, uh, the other side of the story when it comes to uh, end users or, you know, your QA people when they are testing. Maybe they can poke holes in my app and, you know, figure out things that I have not tested, uh. right? So uh, if you give them Fiddler, they can poke around all of those endpoints and uh, try shutting things on and off, slowing things down or, you know, speeding things up and just try to figure out all the different ways in which your app can be broken. So it is, you know, really good for Q- QA people. But then once your app, you know, hits, uh, you know, the end users, uh, you want to know what's going on. And the classic, you know, works on my machine, but doesn't work on yours. Sure. Uh, that should not be an excuse anymore. You should be able to see exactly what the user is experiencing. And that's where, you know, the end user capturing tools come in. That is, you know, Fiddler Jam and, uh, you know, Fiddler Cap. You mentioned that you could be working with somebody else in your team and I see that there's some features for team collaboration in the, in the app. So tell me how that works. What you can do in the inside the application is capture some sessions. For example, you may say that um, you, you have faced an issue and then you can share them with specific emails. For example, you can share them with me and you can even mark the sessions, let's say four of them in with red background just to note that I need to take a look at those four. Or you can even write a comment on each of them and say, I see something um, inaccurate here. What will happen is that um, if Fedora is running on on my site, I will uh, receive a notification and I will be able to download this uh, all of those sessions immediately and inspect them. And I can even uh, update the comment, mark the sessions in different way, or even update them in some way. For example, I can fix some of the parameters. On your site, while Fedora is working, you will also automatically receive all of those updates. So we can work together to uh, 
inspect and investigate what is causing the issues. This is one part of the of the sharing. Um, in addition, what what you can add is uh, password protection because we know that the sessions can contain a lot of sensitive information, passwords, tokens. Uh, if you add this password, it will be uh, quite signed encryption and you shouldn't worry about that uh, if you go through our servers and what will happen there uh, because it will be already encrypted and only people who have the password will be able to decrypt it. Wow, cool. Uh, the same can happen with uh, API requests. As some already mentioned, we have the ability to compose some of those API requests. I often use them, by the way, when I do some reverse engineering. Uh, it's kind of useful for me to capture the traffic to see what uh, a specific web application is doing mm -hmm. and then uh, get some of the requests directly edited in the composer. And of course, I try to remove all of the, all of the headers and parameters just to see which, I which of them I actually need. And once I have a successful request, then what I actually do is just export the request in as a script. Fiddler has this capability that you can export the the already built request in a in a Node.js script or uh, or curl request or whatever you need, and then I use it inside my applications. Uh, so what I can do in this case is save this request that I've already captured, I can save it as a collection. And if I want to, to share it with my team, I can do it again with emails. And the last part for the moment is the sharing of the rules. We've already mentioned how powerful they can be. You can spend a lot of time building your, your rules. For example, um, we have our own rule sets that helps us to test Fedor everywhere. Yeah, it may be surprising, but in some cases, our cases are using Fedor everywhere to test Fedor everywhere to see how that will behave if you have a failure in specific endpoints. Uh. So they have built such, such rules and uh, they can share them with the, between them. When a new QA comes in the team, they can just share the, the, those rules and it's uh, easy peasy to do it. Yeah. You know, you said when you were talking about the rule builder about being able to change things and I don't want to gloss over that. I mean, uh, a request and response mocking is a big part of what that does. And how would somebody go about using that and to what end? So I can, I can try taking that. Uh, so essentially, uh, and, and Rosen mentioned a few ways in which teams can work together. But to me, like the rules builder is particularly best suited for a collaborative type of environment uh. because you are really getting down to the details of every request and response and being able to change everything about uh. it. So when I am building uh, an app that's hitting a certain endpoint, I want to work with Rosen and I want to save my rules because that is fine tuned to exactly what my app app is hitting and exactly what we are expecting out of it. And if I can save my rules and have him pull up the same rules uh, on his fiddler, then we are on the same page. Right. We know exactly which API you know, endpoint we are hitting, uh, what are the parameters going in and out, and how we can fake things out of the way. Uh, and again, all of this, you know, sounds a little bit like, um, we are, we are, you know, enabling evil. We're just giving you more power <laughs> if you think about. It. No, no, you're in a debugging scenario. Just to understand what's going on. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely critical. Yeah. I was thinking about Fiddler Jam from a tech support perspective. And the number of times I've dealt with a user that has like some add in that's a weirdo ad blocker or something and is knocking out a feature of the website. Yeah. And you could go around in circles for a long time trying to figure out what the heck that was. But if you saw the fiddler trace on it and saw that that message was just not being received, that it wasn't making the request, you've got a pretty good hint that the browser's blocking it or some unhandled right. JavaScript error. Damn, that or never happened. JavaScript. JavaScript being turned off, if, you, if that's the worst case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, again, the idea is, uh, you know, your engineering hours are, you know, valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we want to sometimes protect those hours. And that's where you have, you know, layers of, you know, support. And uh, to Richard's point, you don't know what people have running on their machines. Like, no. I am scared to look at my, you know, parents' browsers with all of their extensions. Like, they can, you know, barely see a web page. It's just so full of tools because they say yes to everything. But Grandma Franklin this has a, at least 104 <laughs> weather applications <laughs> in her taskbar. Just right, saying. right. So 
This is a way in which they can hit one small button and it starts capturing as they're utilizing your app, as they're running through your app. And if you, you know, let it, it will also capture a little bit of video to go along. Like I clicked on this button and you can see the Fiddler logs kind of, you know, follow that along. Yeah. And once you have that, you can, you know, give it off to your first layer of support and they can say, no, it's that extension thing that you have blocked or it's that other thing that you have turned off that's, you know, not even letting you make the requests and responses. But if it is truly a legitimate, you know, a bug that you want engineering to take a look at, that's when you just save off the same sessions that you captured right. from Fiddler Jam and you just load it up in Fiddler all the way back to your engineering teams who can look at a session as if their app is running on their local machine, uh, but it's just something the user has recorded. Yeah. Now you don't need to reproduce because you literally have a copy of what caused the problem in the first place. No, you skip all of that. Yeah, and just to add here, regarding Fiddler Jam, the one of the most... The, the coolest thing about Fiddler Jam is that it captures not only the network requests and the, as some mentioned video, it also captures your actions. For example, user clicked on this div, uh, user uh, scrolled the page, user did uh, or different whatever you are doing on the on the page, it is captured. In addition, it captures the the console works, the errors. So if you have an extension that is uh, blocking something, you will see it in the console and you will see it in the capture work. Uh, from Fidmar Jam. And the cool thing is that the extension is free. Everyone can install it and use it. Mm -hmm. uh, the the paid features come from the analysis of those works. So once your, your end users capture the traffic, they will receive a link and they will send you the link. So you need to to have a, a license to, to open this link. Cool. And, and then, yeah, it just works everywhere. And what's the difference between Jam and um, what's the, and Cap? It's a, Jam is a browser-based uh, extension essentially. Right. So it's a Chrome Chromium-based extension for you know your browser-based web apps. But if you rather have a desktop app that you want to look into, so Fiddler Cap is a very lightweight Windows desktop app. Okay. But it does the same thing. So it'll capture everything on your end user's machine. Um, without you having to, you know, have them run through your entire app. You can just, you know, have it installed and have them, you know, execute a few things and you can capture the same logs. Can I get out of the PC with Fiddler? Can I try and get all the traffic off of an IoT device? Like, is there, do I convince that device to add, to use me as a proxy? Yes, in a way, and then Rosen can speak more to this, but, mm. you know, uh, at the end of the day, anybody who speaks HTTP to an endpoint, you can capture it, but you will have that, you need to have that IoT or any type of other device be able to go through a machine. Right. So all of that, you know, devices traffic is also captured. So you ask the device to speak to you as the gateway so that you can then proxy through it. Which is not that that hard to do. You set well, you can go in and configure the network settings for that IoT device. You just push it through that way. So yeah, we are you know trying to enable developers to have as much visibility. Mm -hmm. and again, you know, we are not trying to be able. I mean, we have had tools like you know Telerik, you know disassemble, and uh, we let you decompile DLLs, so you really can you know reverse engineer and look through a lot of things. But this is you know just literally power in your hands and full visibility in your hands, so you know what's going on in your network. Yeah, I mean, I think about low even lower level tools like Wireshark, but. Now you're just looking at the actual network protocols. Like it's it, for a lot of folks, I think it's too low level. Right. Yeah. Uh, you you don't care about a lot of that information. You want to focus on the application message traffic that's flowing back and forth. Right. It's not a protocol analyzer. It's a debugging tool. Yeah. And if you care enough about, or if you know what you're doing, especially with you know protobuf or you know Rosen mentioned, we have a hex uh, analyzer that shows you the hex of the request and responses. That's a little you know hardcore for me, mm -hmm. but if you wanted, if you understood what assembly looks like, then that could be a useful tool for you. Oh, you can always write your own tool. You know, just like you can go grow your own electrons and make a PC from it. Like <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work, right? I got stuff to do. The, the goal was to make a tool. The goal was to solve a problem. And if the tool already exists, you should be using the tool. They've thought about things you haven't thought about yet. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, the something that, uh, that we are trying to do is make it even easier for the people to, to use the tool. For example, um, when you want to capture, um, curl requests in order to uh, to capture them in Fiddler, you need to provide a specific argument. Uh, when you want to do it with Node.js, you need to set some uh, environment variables. 
But instead of doing all of those, we are trying to introduce new features inside the application that will automatically handle those for you. For example, in the next release, we are going to introduce such uh, such option, uh, instrumented terminal that will uh, set all of those for you and will help you. So instead of wondering, okay, which was the parameter, how to set it, where to find it, and all of those, just run your application through this uh, through this terminal and the network requests will be captured. Uh, same is valid for .NET applications with a little bit uh, tweaks regarding the certificates. Uh, you'll be able to run them through through this terminal and without changing your the configuration inside your application, you'll be able to to capture their network traffic. Right. Yeah. So what essentially Rosen is trying to point to is we are thinking ahead as to what you know this tool that has been you know beloved and used you know for decades now by developers. How does this evolve? And we always want to have developers have all the power, but you know what's next? Let's think about automation. Mm-hmm. You know, as we are you know, and we spend a lot of time on the minutest of things like the uh, dev teams do because like those are important. Like how you do your searches are important. Mm-hmm. How you filter down to every detail is important. We also have ways in which you can now, you know, take two rows of sessions, you know, uh, as we are testing our app. One failed, one worked, and you don't know why. Right. right. So now you can compare every part of that request, every part of the response to see exactly what's the difference between two. But all of that, again, is part of your dev workflow. But, you know, if you think about automation, like you want to hit a whole bunch of APIs and you want to see what's coming back and you want to have all of this as a script, right? So now we let you save off your sessions, your request and responses, and open it up in a terminal, open it up as curl, and have that as a set of instructions that you do maybe as a CI CD pipeline. Uh, so these are things we are thinking ahead as to mm-hmm. see how Fiddler evolves. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I presume you're not going to get out of the traffic business. Fair, that it's fair. about traffic going in and out of a device. That I appreciate that you're getting into different kinds of traffic besides just HTTPS. Of course, there's HTTP 3. But is that really that much of a stretch for you for to implement? Are we already, you know, using it? Well, I don't want to spoil the, the news here, but uh, we are looking at HTTP three. Okay, and uh, we'll see what what will happen. Uh, if people demand for it, then we'll have to do it. Yeah, I just did a run as episode where we were talking about SMB over Quick, which is HTTP three. Just this idea of like no more VPNs. We want file access, uh, but securely and and fast. And those those techniques work really well, but they sit a little lower level than than web. Yeah, and as as you mentioned, security it is security is quite important for us. And everything what we are doing, we are trying to. To put all of our efforts to to ensure that we will not uh, expose users' information, to ensure that we will not allow protocol violations. For example, when we were working on the HTTP two, we took a lot of time to to ensure that we are actually following all the requirements of the protocol. And mm-hmm. if something is broken, to be sure that we will show it to the users and to tell them. There are many tools that will ignore such errors. Even browsers do it for some of them. Mm-hmm. But we prefer to be on the safe side and to uh, to handle those errors in a different way, to show the people that they happened, the, there might be some issues over there. One of the, the latest things that we are introducing is the, you know that when you have a problem with the certificate uh, on some website, uh, the browsers are trying to prevent it for you. But in some cases, you want to allow it for, let's say, localhost development or some of your internal servers. Mm-hmm. So... Until now, we had an option to ignore all of those errors, but we didn't feel comfortable with it because you had to ignore all of them, not uh, just for this specific certificate and domain. So now with the late, with the new release, we are going to, to change this and you'll be able to set it for only one of the, one of the certificate that you, that has an error. That's cool. So this, this way we think that our users will feel much safer. Also, we are looking at different compliances. We are looking to extend the ability to uh, to ensure that Fiddler can work in different environments. Mm-hmm. As, as we've already mentioned, it's working behind login. So we are wondering what will happen if people need to work without uh, in a restricted environment where they will have uh, no access to our login endpoints. What will happen there? How they are going to use the application? We know that we have such users out there. We just need more 
information, what are the requirements, and we work on it. Interesting. Yeah, very yeah. cool. Very challenging. So what's next? What's on the Fiddler horizon? Well, uh, the team has been super busy, and uh, we have actually internally, you know, uh, tried to align. Uh, you know, it's a big portfolio of products we have, uh, you know, between Telerik and, you know, Candy UI and Fiddler and Sitefinity and all the other things we do. So we have been, you know, trying to align some, you know, our releases are, you know, uh, the major releases go out together. So, you know, we're looking at maybe three uh, major releases in a wow. year for Fiddler okay. uh, with, you know, little things in between, service packs in between. You know, like Rosen said, we are uh, you know, thinking about offline capabilities. Maybe you're working with Fiddler on a plane and, you know, maybe you're just doing local host and that's fine. Uh, so, you know, also thinking ahead at, you know, what's next with, you know, WebSockets, what's next with gRPC. Sure. What other low-level protocols come along that matter to us? Uh, that's true. Yeah. So, you know, enable developers to see everything in your network as best as we can. That's very cool. Thank you, guys. It's been great. Great, great work. All kudos go to, you know, Rosen and the team. It's been, you know, several years of engineering, but uh, we are happy where we stand today. Yeah, I'm sure our listeners will take it for a spin. And uh, we'll see them next time on Dot and Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band.